Hey guys, welcome back. In this presentation, we will finish our discussion of International Plumbing Code, Chapter 3, on General Regulations. We will be covering from Section 307 to 316, so let's get started. Okay, Section 307 goes over structural safety. We talked about this in the last presentation, but you don't want to be a hack. You don't want to be chopping things apart or destroying structure as you're installing plumbing, pipe, and systems. So these are some rules that we need to know to make sure that we don't destroy the structure. Now, important to note that a lot of information regarding structural safety is in Appendix C that is in the back of your code book. So a lot of these, as you read it, it says uh, 307.1 general go look at the international building code 307.2 notching cutting notching and board holes go look at the international building code 307.3 penetrations of floor ceiling assemblies and fire resistant rated assemblies go look at the international building code you see the pattern but maybe you don't have a copy of the international building code don't worry that is covered in appendix c so you flip to the back of your book and in appendix c you have the information that you need in order to know what you should and should not do let's look at what you should and should not do and we've talked through 307.3 307.4 we will look at here trusses 307.5 trench location and 307.6 uh, the piping materials exposed within plenums all of these dealing with structural safety Hey, Plumber Tom here. Many times in the rough-in stage of plumbing, we're going to need to put pipes inside of the walls. This means we will need to notch or drill the studs in order to get the pipes in the wall. A simple application of this would be drilling holes through the studs for an arm that would come over to catch a sink. We're going to want to make sure that there's a slope to that. So for each hole, we're going to change the elevation. Let's say we have a hole that starts at 19 inches. If the studs are 16 inches apart, then we would go quarter inch per foot, which would equal about 3 eighths of an inch. The next hole would be 19 and 3 eighths. Then we would add another 3 eighths of an inch, and the next hole would be 19 and 3 quarters. This way we can create a slope in the wall, through the holes, through the studs, and the pipe will be able to drain. Before we talk about how much you could drill or notch on a stud, you need to understand the difference between a non-bearing and a bearing wall. A non-bearing is a partition wall just made to hang sheetrock and create room space. Most of the time you can identify a framed non-bearing wall by the fact that it only has one top plate. A bearing wall, on the other hand, is a wall that is intended to hold up weight. It's structural. Often these are exterior walls, but there are also bearing walls on the inside of a building. These hold up joists, trusses, or other structural members. A good way to identify a bearing wall is that there are going to be two boards on the top plate. So you can look for that when you're on the rough. Notice the walls that have two boards on the top plate. Building codes will only allow for us to drill or notch through bearing and non-bearing studs for a certain amount. Notching is where you take a sawzall and chop into the side and actually cut out a section of the pipe. In this situation I needed to turn a corner so I drilled a hole but ended up notching it so that I could fit my fitting back inside the studs. The better option is to bore or drill a hole through the stud because that leaves more strength. Now code determines that in a bearing wall you can notch 25% and you can bore or drill 40% of a bearing stud. On a non-bearing stud you can notch up to 40% of the stud and you can bore or drill 60% of the stud. One other important note as we are drilling holes, we have to keep a certain distance from the face of the stud. Code says that you need a total of 5 eighths of an inch, so hold that back off of the face a little. That's going to leave some structure in the front. Here we have holes that are cut towards the face of one side of a 2x6 stud. It may or may not be enough there. There's 5 eighths is what's required. And that looks to me a little bit less, maybe half or a quarter. So that hole would need to be back in a little bit more. 307.3 talks about penetrations for floor and ceiling assemblies. Whenever you pass through floor, ceilings, or walls that are fire rated, 
you need to maintain that fire rating. There's a, there are fire collars or sleeves that can be put into those walls or also a fire caulk that you can use to fill in around the pipe. Let's talk for a few minutes about some things you need to know before you start drilling into structure. First of all, there are different types and we'll cover a few of them here. Let's look at solid wood. You might have 2x8s, 2x10s, or 2x12s. When it comes to drilling in solid wood, you are not to touch the top 2 inches or the bottom 2 inches, and your hole has to be maximum of one-third the size of the board. More common these days are the I-joist or the TJI, given the name because of the shape. There's a strong top member and a bottom member, and then there's some OSB webbing on the inside of that. That's where we're going to drill our pipes through. We are not allowed to touch or drill or cut the top or the bottom on any of these eye joists because that's where all the structural strength is. So our goal is to drill through the webbing. The rule of thumb for drilling on these is that for every one inch of hole size, you need to be one foot away from a bearing point. So if I have a four inch hole, I need to be four feet. If I have a three inch hole, I need to be three feet. Check with the manufacturer for details on that. A glue lamp beam is used to span wide spaces or to carry a lot of weight. Often an eye joist will be attached to one of these. Now when we drill these, we got to be real careful. A glue lamp beam is a whole bunch of sheets of wood that have been glued and compressed together. And we can only drill through these if we have permission from an engineer. That hole would need to be in the center of the beam. Because these are so important to structure, you want to be real careful not to damage them. Last, let's have a look at the floor trusses. These are really easy for running pipes through because there's a lot of open space between support members. But because they're a truss, you are never to cut, notch, drill, or do anything to the structure. Now, that goes for trusses in the roof as well. You can't be cutting, drilling, notching, or doing anything. We can run our pipes through them, but there really is no reason for us to be cutting or affecting those trusses at all. Let's talk about the solid wood joists. You can notch the top of a joist, but only one sixth of the depth. So for a plumber, you might be like trying to lay PEX tubing down under the floor, and so you could notch down into there a little bit. But there's really not a lot that you would want to do as far as notching beyond that. You can do something similar. You're just notching up into the solid wood joist but again, one sixth is the maximum that you can cut into that. It doesn't leave you really much for running pipe. Another important point is that those notches should not be within the middle third of that span. You don't wanna be notching within that space. Now let's say you're gonna drill a hole in a solid wood joist. You have to leave at least two inches on top and two inches on bottom, and the hole cannot be any bigger than one third the height of that joist. There's a section that talks about the cold formed steel studs and what you can and cannot do with those. Basically any of your holes going through those studs need to be 24 inches apart and a lot of times manufacturers have already punched holes for us but that might not always be in a convenient location for where we're running pipe so we may be punching a hole but the four inches is the maximum height of those holes, one and a half inches is the maximum width for a, a typical stud, and you should not be putting holes within the first 10 inches from the floor coming up. 307.5 talks about protection of footings. It says, trenching installed parallel to footings and walls shall not extend into the bearing plane of the footing or wall. What that means is, if you have a foundation with a footing, that's the concrete below that's holding up the foundation, the earth underneath that is also bearing weight. And if you go dig in right next to a footing, you're undermining the earth that's holding up the building. So we've got to stay out of that. And what they give us as a rule is a 45 degree angle. It says the upper boundary of a bearing plane is a line that extends downward at an angle of 45 degrees from horizontal from the outside bottom edge of the footing. You can see that here. There's that perforated line. There's a trench. We can put our pipe anywhere out there, but we cannot dig or put our trench near or below that 45 degree. Here's another example. Now it makes it fairly easy for us because as plumbers we understand triangles with 45 degrees, but a real basic rule of thumb there would be 
For every one foot that you go down, you come out one foot away from the bottom of the footing. So if it's a four foot trench, then I need to be four feet away and I won't come into that bearing point. Take a look at this foundation. You have the foundation and several footings running through the middle. That's that concrete that runs and it's going to hold up the frame walls. Where is the plumbing run? Well, we separated that plumbing that's running parallel. Now, of course, there's a few tunnels underneath. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about running a whole trench alongside of a footing. So in this case, I just measured between the two footings, found the center, and that way I was plenty far away from either one, even if I went a couple feet down. This way we can preserve the earth that is supporting the building. Let's move on to 308. This is where we talk about pipe support. Now a pipe support is what's going to be holding up the pipe. This includes hangers, straps, any other thing that we would put in place to keep the pipe where it needs to be. In general, it says plumbing pipe shall be supported in accordance with this section. Uh, 308.2 says seismic supports where earthquake loads are applicable. Then again, they refer us to the International Building Code. Then we'd have to have anchors and braces to hold the pipe in case of an earthquake. Materials 308.3 says hangers, anchors, supports shall support the piping and the contents of the piping. So let's look at that. If you have a drain, most of the time a drain is empty. But if the drain gets plugged, it's going to fill all the way up with water. And that's quite a big weight difference since water weighs 8.33 pounds per gallon. You get enough gallons in there, we're talking hundreds or even thousands of pounds. So the hangers have to be able to hold the weight of the pipe plus whatever's inside of that pipe when it's full. 308.4 talks about structural attachment. Hangers and anchors shall be attached to the building construction in an approved manner. There are a lot of different things that we can use to anchor into or connect to the building structure. Structure being studs, joists, trusses, anything that's holding up walls and the roof. But pipe needs to be supported by that structure. That means we're not supporting pipe by the sheetrock that's hanging on the structure. We have to go directly to the structure itself. 308.5 gives us details about hanger spacing. Depending on the type of pipe, there is a maximum distance that you can have between those supports or hangers. And so there's a whole table in there, 308.5. Down the far left column, we have different types of pipe that we might use in plumbing. The second column gives us maximum horizontal spacing in feet. And the third column gives us maximum vertical spacing in feet. And this spacing is referring to the distance between those supports. So this is something that you would probably want to memorize portions of this table. For example, if you use PVC every day, you would want to remember that you have a maximum horizontal distance of four feet between hangers holding that horizontal pipe in place and you would have a maximum of 10 feet for vertical supports on a PVC pipe. You may deal with cast iron, copper, CPVC, ABS, there's a lot listed on here. It is important for you to remember what the hanger spacing and support spacing is for the different pipes that you use on a regular basis. Here is an example of pipe support within floor joists. When we're drilling and running through the joists, perpendicular to the joists, as you can see on the left, well, every one of those joists serves as a support. However, when we go run between the joists, now we're running parallel with them, you can see we need to get some more support. These supports for PEX tubing need to be every 32 inches. 308.6 talks about sway bracing and this is for four inch pipes and larger that are hung horizontally. So what happens is, let's say you have a drain and it needs to change direction so you have some offsets and the wastewater inside of that drain is moving along and then all of a sudden it changes direction. It has momentum so it pushes, it has mass and pushes against the wall of the pipe and then it changes direction and it pushes 
the other way against the wall of the pipe and as it's doing that it can actually swing the pipe that's swaying now if a pipe sways you might think well what's the big deal it becomes a big deal when over time that swaying starts to stress the joints so in order to make sure that the pipe won't crack or leak they require rigid bracing for changes of direction that are greater than 45 degrees. As we talk about pipe moving under pressure or with fluids moving inside of it, 308.7 talks about anchorage location and how there's going to be strategic anchors placed. Like in this illustration, there's a thrust block. It's going to keep those pipes from moving and that's going to prevent damage to the pipes. Section 808 talks about expansion joint fittings, and those are only installed where absolutely necessary, according to code. 308.9 talks about parallel water distribution. This is where you have a whole bunch of PEX lines and you're running them all together. Those pipes need to be supported at the bends. These parallel water distribution systems or PEX pipes that are all bundled together can be bundled in a group like this, but hot and cold would need to be separated by insulation so that the hot water isn't transferring temperature into the cold. 308.10 is where we have the requirement for a thermal expansion tank. It says this is not to be supported by the pipe that connects two such tanks. So in this illustration you can see an expansion tank that is installed on top of a copper pipe and the only thing holding it up is the copper pipe. Well, when that tank fails and it fills all the way up with water, it's going to weigh quite a bit and it could weigh as much as 20 pounds and all of that weight is being pushed right on top of a relatively soft copper pipe. So these expansion tanks must be supported independently of whatever pipe they are connected to. Section 309 gives some specific information about flood hazard resistance. So anywhere that there's a flood hazard area, they refer us over to the International Building Code for more details. Section 310 talks about washroom and toilet requirements and basically requiring that there is ventilation. And even though it doesn't have this written in here, your options for ventilation are either to have a bathroom fan, an electric fan, or to have an openable window. It also talks about the location of fixtures and how those fixtures should not get in the way of doors or openings so that you can access those fixtures. Section 311 talks about toilet facilities for workers and provides the requirement for that. Interestingly, the Utah Amendments has gone and deleted the requirement for these toilet facilities for workers. Now, most of the time a contractor is going to provide a portable restroom for workers for sanitation reasons, but sometimes you run into a real cheapo and they don't give you anywhere to do your business. And apparently Utah is okay with that. I kind of strongly disagree. When I built my house, I made sure that they had one of these on site because I know what construction workers do when there's not somewhere to pee. They just pee all over the job. Section 312 gives us the specific requirements for tests and inspections of pipes. Why do we test pipe? Well, have you ever heard a plumber say, I never leak? I have worked with people, plumbers, who seriously said that. I mean, they, they really meant it. And I'm pretty sure that they leaked. I know for a fact that I myself often have leaked in spite of all of my best efforts to put together a quality plumbing system. I leak. I forget to crimp a joint. I miss a glue and it just doesn't seal all the way. So it's important that we test all of the pipe that we install so that there won't be problems later. So what can we test with? We can test with water, fill it up with water, pressurize it, or we can use air. And in an air test, we have to cap everything off and compress the air. Those are our options. 312.1.1 gives us specific information about the gauges. If we have a low pressure test, for example, a drainage test only needs to have five pounds. We have to have a gauge that will show pressure in those lower increments. So this says 0.10 PSI increments. 
for testing at 10 PSI or less. By using this gauge, we can see pretty well if we're losing pressure and if the system is good. 312.2 gives us the option to test drainage and vent using water. We would cap a lower vent and fill it all the way up to the top. At a minimum, this has to have a 10 foot water head that creates about five pounds of pressure and hold for 15 minutes. We do also have the option of capping everything and filling it up with air unless it is plastic pipe. The code says you cannot use plastic pipe, but then the Utah amendments comes back through and they say, well, <laughs> it's Utah. We're not going to use water in the middle of January. So we will allow the testing of plastic pipe with air. When it comes to an air test pressure on drainage, we have to have five PSI for 15 minutes. Drainage waste and vents do require a final inspection when the building is all done. This is just a visual inspection. So we look it over and say, yeah, this, this isn't leaking, right? But if there's concern for a leak, there is the possibility of using a smoke test. And by pushing smoke into the vent system, that smoke will show you if there are any leaks. When it comes to testing water lines, 312.5 says that you can inspect the entire system or you can do it in sections. You are not to test it with less than the working pressure. So if it's going to have 70 PSI, you would need to test to 70 PSI. And also not less than 50 PSI. That test would also need to hold for 15 minutes. Gravity sewer tests, force sewer tests, and storm sewer tests all have the same requirements as the drainage we've talked about. 10 foot water head if you're using water, 15 minutes. 5 PSI if you're using air, 15 minutes. While plumbers don't very often install shower liners, this kind of falls into the tile guys or the cultured marble guys territory. 312.9 does require that the shower liner is tested before it gets covered. So the way you test that is you plug the drain and you would need to create at least two inches of standing water in the pan and let that sit for 15 minutes. If there's not a threshold, meaning it's just like a roll in handicap shower, you would have to build a threshold so that you can prove that that pan is not going to leak. Section 314 gives us quite a bit of information about condensate disposal. I'd encourage you to look through that, but let me pull out the most important stuff. When it comes to a condensate drain, 314.1 says that the minimum slope is 1%, that is 1 8 inch per foot. 314.2 says that the minimum pipe size for a condensate drain is 3 quarter inch. And condensate drains are required to have an auxiliary and a secondary drain system. That means you have a drain, let's look at this, you have a drain, say from a furnace or an air conditioning coil, and it's going to drain. And then you also have a secondary drain coming off of that. In case the primary drain gets plugged or has a problem, there's another pipe that's going to allow that condensate to go to a good location. Section 315 talks about pipe penetrations and how the annular space, that's the space around the pipe, must be sealed. And Section 316 mentions alternative engineered designs. There may be other ideas or possibilities for the way to put things together. Those would need to be approved by a code official. Hopefully this presentation helps you to understand International Plumbing Code Chapter 3 on general regulations. Please take time in your daily work to notice the things that we've talked about in this chapter and where they apply. When you're digging trenches, when you're hanging hangers, when you're drilling structure, there are many things in this chapter that we use every day. Make that a part of your understanding in your daily work and you will be so much the better plumber. We'll see you next time.